Okay, today we're going to talk about Green's functions. Uh, these are basically a, uh, a form of eigenfunction expansion, if you want to think of them that way. Uh, but we sort of do it once and for all so that we obtain an integral operator that does the eigenfunction expansion for us, uh, given any inhomogeneous term. So this is going to be useful for solving problems that involve a self-adjoint operator uh, with homogeneous boundary conditions uh, that are inhomogeneous. And, uh, you know, again, the, the, the way that we solve this uh, will give us a uh, integral operator with a kernel, that's the Green's function, that's going to allow us to just integrate the inhomogeneous term and recover the solution to the partial differential equation. It's quite a, quite a neat framework for solving partial differential equations and quite powerful for many, for many physical problems. Uh, so, so we're going to suppose that we have this self-adjoint operator L, and we've got homogeneous boundary conditions for this, so we should be able to find eigenfunctions. Those eigenfunctions would look like this. Uh, L acting on UK is equal to an eigenvalue uh, multiplied by UK. And if we had the full set of those eigenfunctions, then we could do an eigenfunction expansion. And that eigenfunction expansion would look something like this. We would first expand the function u in terms of the eigenfunctions. And we would also expand the function f, that is our inhomogeneous term, in terms of those same eigenfunctions. And, uh, and then we would plug those two expressions into our differential equation and get something back that looks like this, right? So, uh, so here's the expansion for the operator acting on u. Uh, every time the operator acts on an eigenfunction, it returns an eigenvalue. Uh, the other term here, lambda, note lambda is not an eigenvalue, it's just a parameter in the problem. Uh, but in this case, it's going to have the same units as each of the eigenvalues, so we've given it the symbol lambda. And over here is the uh, eigenfunction expansion of our inhomogeneous term. So now what we're going to do is use it orthogonality, uh, and we're going to go through and take the inner product of this whole equation with one of the eigenfunctions, say u sub m. And that's going to give us this expression. So uh, after we've done that and done a little bit of algebra, we cover this. Uh, Cm uh, times, so this is an expansion coefficient multiplied by the difference between the eigenvalue and this parameter is equal to this fm expansion coefficient for the f function. Solving for the unknown here, which is the expansion coefficients of the unknown function, uh, that gives us this expression for those expansion coefficients. They are uh, fm over lambda m minus lambda. Now, if we remember, what were these fm coefficients, right? So these are the expansions of the inhomogeneous term function. And if we write out the definition of that expansion coefficient, it's an inner product uh, with uh, the eigenfunction multiplied by the corresponding eigenfunction multiplied by the function f and then integrated over the interval. Uh, I could, for example, write uh, a to b if my homogeneous boundary conditions are at a and b here in this, in this problem. Okay, so, so now if we put all of this together and just write down what was the original expansion, it was uk of x multiplied by ck. And ck is this expression here with the fm taking this value, right? So this is the solution to this problem uh, written out as an expansion in the eigenfunctions. And notice that the expansion coefficients also involve integration over the eigenfunctions. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move the summation inside the integral sign. This is an integral over x prime. And I can move things that only depend on x inside with no problem. And uh, then what we obtain is an integral that looks like this. So we have u of x is equal to an integral of a summation. These are all of the things that involve index k here. So uh, we're summing over the eigenfunctions at x and also at x prime multiplied together and uh, divided by lambda k minus lambda. And then multiplying by f of x prime and integrating that. And so you can think of this thing in parentheses here as a function. And we give it the name g of x and x prime. Uh, so we think of this as a function of x with parameter x prime. And this is a Green's function uh, for this physical problem, right? So uh, the operator, so, so what you see here is that the Green's function depends only on the operator and not on the driving force term, which means that now when we use any new function f of x, we can redo the eigenfunction expansion by simply taking the Green's function, which we've already uh, computed is this thing in parentheses, multiply it by the new source term and integrate it and you recover the solution to the new problem. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is quite nifty and uh, let's do a simpler case. Let's suppose that we didn't have that term with the parameter lambda sitting in there. Uh, then we would have L acting on U uh, is equal to F of X. This is the equation that we want to solve 
to find u of x. And if we were to, to say that we knew the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of this problem, that, that would be uh, a given like this. You'd have L acting on uk is equal to lambda k acting on uk. And in this case, we would recover that the Green's function is just a function of x with parameter x prime. That's a sum over all of the eigenfunctions uh, with u of x multiplied by u of uk of x prime uh, divided by the lambda k. Okay, so notice one of the properties of the Green's functions. This denominator can't be zero. In the previous problem, we saw that that denominator, uh, we could not have the case where lambda k, any, all of the lambda k's must be different from lambda. Here, we find that all of the lambda k's must be different from zero because we didn't have that lambda term in here. And we also have to start with normalized eigenfunctions in order to construct uh, this series properly. Okay, so that they all have the appropriate weight. Uh, okay, so uh, I should say a few more words about this. We are writing down these expressions as though we're working with real valued functions. Um, so in general, we could have complex valued functions, for example, the spherical harmonics that we just recently did. Uh, then in those cases, you would have to complex conjugate uh, the kth eigenfunction as a function of x and multiply it by the kth eigenfunction as a function of x prime. Okay, so this is the case, more general case for complex valued eigenfunctions. So uh, if, we, if we now uh, just remember that, you know, what's going to happen in this, after we found the Green's function, we're going to find the solution to our, part, to our differential equation by integrating between the boundary conditions g of x and x prime multiplied by f of x prime uh, over x prime. Uh, so, so what is this function g of x, right? So uh, it is a kernel of an integral operator that serves the purpose of inverting this Hermitian differential operator L, right? And to kind of see uh, why we say that this is, a, this is an inversion process, then think about what's happening here, right? We had a differential operator that acts on u and gives me a function f of x. And in order to invert this equation, I could imagine saying, well, this involves derivatives. So the inverse operator here is going to have to involve some form of integration. And indeed, that's what happens, right? So this is an integral equation that gives me, uh, it's not really an integral equation, uh, but it, it's an integral that with a kernel, g of x, that multiplies by my f of x before integration and gives me the solution to this equation. So, it, so in a sense, um, this inverts this equation, this operation L, to give me the u of x. Okay, so let's see that more explicitly in the case of a matrix problem, right? So we've solved these problems many times before. Uh, suppose we have AX uh, equals F in a, with a matrix that's a Hermitian. A equals A Hermitian conjugate. And, we, and suppose we know all of the eigenfunctions or all the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of that Hermitian matrix and that none of those eigenvalues are zero, right? Then what we can do is we can take the matrix A, we can diagonalize it, we can write down the matrix A in terms of the eigenvalue matrix and in terms of the matrix of eigenvectors for that problem. And we know that that matrix is going to be unitary from the spectral theorem. And, uh, and if we now go through and invert A, what do we find? We find uh, that the inverse of A is the matrix lambda inverse sandwiched between these uh, two matrices of, of, uh, of eigenvectors for, for the matrix A. And if we write that out, in terms of uh, summation notation, then what we find is that that it's just given by this, right? We've got uk, uh, uk dagger uh, divided by lambda k, which is exactly the thing that we had up here before, right? So remember um, that that in the general sense, we might write that g uh, is equal to a sum over k. And this is going to look kind of strange, but maybe it will help you recognize some things if you take a quantum mechanics class. Uh, we write that this is a sum over the eigenfunctions as, as kets multiplied by the eigenfunctions as bras and divided by the eigenvalues, right? So, um, so this is sort of the general case that works for uh, matrices and function space. And, uh, and so, so basically we think of this this whole thing, which is a matrix, right? This is a, a dyadic product here. And so, um, so this whole thing that's going to result is a matrix, and it is identically equal to A inverse, right? So G is the inverse of matrix operator A. And, and so that basically says that we can write X 
as G, G operating on F. And so in, this, in the matrix case, G inverts a Hermitian matrix. So, so that's sort of an, a, a very close analogy to what's happening in this, uh, in this case with the Hermitian differential operator, is that G is a kernel of that integral operator uh, that is going to invert the differential operator L. Okay, so, um, so uh, let's also go through and uh, consider what happens when we take a Hermitian uh, operator, that is a self-adjoint operator with, with homogeneous boundary conditions, and we try to solve this problem, uh, this particular inhomogeneous differential equation, L operating on U is equal to uh, a point source, delta of X minus X naught. Okay, so this is Dirac's delta here. Um, so if we apply homogeneous boundary conditions at A and B, uh, and let's suppose that we know this function, this Green's function, g of x and x prime. Then we could write down the solution for u as an integral of that Green's function multiplied by the point source, that is the function f on the right-hand side of this differential equation. Okay, and what that would give us is just the value of the Green's function at x with parameter x naught, the location of the point source. Okay, so what that, so what we've seen here is that the Green's function is actually the solution of the operator acting on u. Uh, equals f, this equation, when that function f is a point source at x naught, right? So we can interpret the Green's function in that sense, that the Green's function is the solution to this problem. And, and this problem is actually not so difficult to, to solve because you can imagine that in most of the uh, region between a and b, this, pro this equation is just a homogeneous equation, right? It's just L u equals zero. And then all of a sudden right here at this point x naught, there's a little spike input uh, that we will be able to deal with by thinking about some of the underlying properties of Green's functions. Okay, so those properties are here. The one that we just mentioned, the Green's function is the solution to uh, this problem. Uh, the operator acting on U is equal to uh, the point source, unit point source at X naught. And the Green's function satisfies the boundary conditions when viewed as a parameter, as a function of X with parameter X naught. And if we also go through and we ask, uh, suppose we have an operator like this. This is the st standard sturm liouville form. Uh, we've worked with many of these problems in the past. Uh, suppose we start with one of these sturm liouville problems and uh, the operator here is self-adjoint because we know the sturm liouville operators are always self-adjoint. And uh, we look at the Green's function. That Green's function will be a continuous function of x. That is to say there are no discontinuities in the function when viewed as a function of this x parameter. Uh, now, if we also ask, what about the derivatives of this Green's function? We know that there is always a discontinuity in the derivative with respect to x at location x naught. Specifically, that discontinuity is the derivative of g with respect to x just to the right of x naught minus the derivative of g with respect to x just to the left of x naught is equal to minus 1 over this coefficient p evaluated at x naught, where p is this function that comes from the operator. Uh, so, so what does typical Green's function look like? Um, you know, if you have a point source at x naught and you have boundary conditions at a and b that say in this case make u go to zero here, then what you're going to get as a Green's function is something that looks like this. It's flat, it comes up, and then, uh, and then it reaches a, a peak here, and the, the derivative discontinuously changes, but the function itself is continuous, and then it starts to go down, and it comes back down and matches the other boundary condition. So, so these are all clues. These rules are all clues that are going to allow us to go through and solve uh, for, for the Green's function by solving this equation, right? So it turns out that in many cases, it's much easier to find the Green's function by solving this problem than by finding the uh, all of the set of eigenfunctions and summing them out to infinity. Okay, so I think that's all uh, for this little lecture, and uh, we'll we'll do some examples in the next one.